Good afternoon. This is Kathy Nickham, the Education Director for the DPC Ed Center, and I'd like to welcome you to our first 2021 webinar. And I think you will find the information very informative as we learn about how to make your wishes known and how to speak up to your health care pro um, providers. I'm excited to um, tell you a little bit more about our speakers who will be um, both interacting a lot with you today. Um, we have both uh, Dr. Dale Lupu and Dr. Elizabeth Anderson with us. And both of them are very active and very involved in the palliative care field. Um, and Dr. Lupu has uh, been involved in integrating palliative care into nephrology care and her four decades of experience building the field of hospice and palliative care has been motivated by the conviction that, quote, the end of the story matters, unquote. I found that um, that really spoke to me and I think that's very important. And um, Dr. Liz Anderson is an assistant professor of social work at Western Carolina University. She practiced as a hospice and palliative care social worker. An anonymous participant has joined the conference. And social services director for the Mid-Atlantic Renal Co Coalition, Coalition, which is where I met her a number of years ago. Before I turn the program over to them, though, I need to give you just a couple of reminders. All of your lines are muted and will stay muted throughout the program. However, you can use the chat box to ask questions and the speakers will be asking for some of your responses and you can use the chat box to interact with them. At the end of the program, we will answer as many questions as we can. And um, we will also have the recording and the slides posted to our website within the next week. And we hope that you will complete the feedback form that is um, at the end of the program that will help us to know programs that you would like and suggestions that you have for us. At this point, I'd like to turn the program over to our presenters. Dale, Liz? Good morning. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? This is Liz. And this is Dale. I realized I was on mute when I was saying hello. <laughs> so Liz and I uh, work together with the Coalition for Supportive Care of Kidney Patients. And the coalition has, in the last year, been uh, finding ways to work more closely with DPC. And we appreciate the opportunity to talk with you guys about the issues of advanced care planning and, and uh, shared decision making. So what we're hoping to do today is, well, first of all, let me say, I wish we were in a room together with you and you could wave at us whenever we said something or jump up and down and we would see you when we said something you didn't agree with, we had a question, we're not in a room with you, we can't see how you're reacting. So please chat to us. If you like what we've said, if you disagree with what we said, if you have a question, we want, we really would like to be as interactive as we can. So we want to just give some basic uh, understanding of what these terms, advanced care planning and shared decision making are about, and why it's a useful thing to know about and why it's a useful thing to do, and then discuss kind of what gets in the way of people entering into doing advanced care planning and doing shared decision making. And as we said here, how you can leap over, tunnel under, or go around the barriers. In other words, we hope to help you get a sense of empowerment and a sense of how to use these tools so they help you, as we said, make your wishes about you. They help you get your health care be about you. So why did Kathy and DPC ask us to present this, this webinar today, uh, we have to acknowledge and right away COVID. Um, the pandemic has, I think, opened the door 
for more frank discussions in our whole country about what happens, what people want in their health care when they are very seriously ill, and what they want when they're at the end of life. And because of COVID, um, I mean, I think we sometimes we could pretend that um, people weren't going to die. But because of COVID, we've seen that it's something we need to talk about and that um, and that things matter so much, you know, the things that we took for granted, the ability to be in the room and hold someone's hand, to hug them, to say in person what you want to say to someone. We have, I think, taken that for granted, and COVID has, the pandemic has stolen that from too many people. So that has opened the door to scary but frank discussions in many families uh, about people's concerns about what might happen to them in the future and what would happen if you are alone and really sick in the hospital. What would happen if you are then unable to speak up for yourself? And it's not just about and again, as COVID has taught us, it's not just about when we kind of sort of predict, okay, now I know I'm at the end of my life. But it's surprising things that can happen. I have a very close friend in her 90s, um, in very good health, taking care of herself, living on her own independently. And she had a kitchen accident, was very badly burned, and has had months of care, unable to speak up for herself. And it looks like she's going to survive. It's amazing. Not just survive, but thrive but unable to speak for herself because she was intubated and on um, so many drugs. So it's, it's helping to avoid surprises for yourself and for people who are going to help care for you by telling them what it is you want. And many of us expect that our family knows what we want, but one of the things research shows us when we actually talk to family members is Sometimes family members or friends know know what we would want, but sometimes they're not really quite sure or they feel a great weight of decision. And, and having a conversation ahead of time can really lift that weight from their shoulders if they have to make decisions. So we want to ask, invite you to chat to us which best describes you? Because we'd like to know a little bit about you. So A, I have no, oh, and if you're on the phone, you can't see the slide. It's, um, there are four responses. A, I have no idea what advanced care planning is. B, I've heard of advanced care planning. C, I know what advanced care planning is. And D, I'm an advanced care planning nerd. And maybe you've even done your advanced directives and brought them to your doctors. So if you just go ahead and just chat in, are you an A, B, C, or D? And we'll just kind of see the, uh, I'm seeing some C's come into the chat and a D, okay. So people who are, who are still knowledgeable, um, more D, another D has come in. Um, no, another D, so, so folks are, so far folks who are chatting in are feeling knowledgeable. So that, that's, that's helpful. Um, so Liz, I think the chats, um, so for somebody who said they were a D but said, I'm still learning, that's why I'm still here, that's why I'm here, yes. Yeah. So hopefully, even if you're a nerd, we can help, we can help advance your nerdiness. So Liz, would you take us to the, as the, yeah. well, the responses right. are coming in? Okay, cool. Um, so similarly, we have another question. So that question was about advanced uh, care plan. So this question is about shared decision making. So same thing, type in for us. I have A, I have no idea what shared decision making means. B, I've heard of shared decision making. C, I know what shared de decision making is. And D, I engage in shared decision making all the time. So I am seeing some B's and C's here. So, okay, sounds like you all know more about advanced care plans than shared decision making, um, which is helpful uh, for us. 
especially since I get to cover advanced care plans, um, which is what we're going to talk about first. <clears throat> so we really wanted to just kind of help fit all of this in. So just to sort of draw your attention to the main circle here, care planning. What we're really talking about is what is the plan for your care? And care, so care planning includes many things. Care planning might include, you know, um, a decision if your kidneys were to stop uh, working, what, uh, what you would want to do. Like maybe you'd want to transplant. Maybe you'd want to do dialysis at home. Um, a care plan might also just include, um, like, what medicines you're going to take or um, if you're going to get some physical therapy. We're at, and so advanced care planning is part of that. It, but it's the part of care planning in which you make a plan for yourself in the event you're in a situation like Dale's 90-year-old friend that you don't have a voice, like that you are not able to talk because of your medical condition. And so an advanced care plan really helps you have a voice for yourself in the event that you can't. Shared decision-making is a little bit different in that shared decision-making is really about how you communicate with your healthcare providers on a regular basis about what it is that you want. And it's shared because it also is informed by your healthcare provider's expertise. So the healthcare provider is giving you information about what kind of treatments are available, and you are saying, hey, okay, well, these are the things that are important to me. Um, so both shared decision-making and advanced care planning fall under care planning, uh, but they're, they're different, although you can see in the, the way the circles join that they also overlap because part of shared decision-making is also talking about what am I going to do in the event that I can't speak for myself, which I think, as Dale has already shared, is such an important conversation right now in light of COVID um, and in light of the fact that in many hospitals, um, caregivers haven't been able to be there to be that voice. So making sure that you're empowered from start to finish. There's more good stuff here. So advanced care planning are future decisions if you are not able to speak for yourself. And shared decision making is uh, current decisions that you're involved in. Um, so we have another poll for you here. I didn't do A, B, C, D, but we can pretend there are A, B, C, Ds here. So we're going to read these responses in case you're on the phone. So which one? most corresponds to you. A, I want control over my health care if I ever can't speak for myself. B, I want to say have a say in my health care decisions. D, I don't want to have to wonder about my future health care. And wait a minute, that was C. And then D, I want to show love to my family by speaking up about what I want in my health care. Um, I suppose you know, there are a lot of overlap in these, um, but what we really wanted to just draw your attention to, and I'm seeing some responses come in. Um, so D, I don't, you know, I want to have a say in my health care decisions. Um, I see some others typing in. D, I want to show my family I love them by speaking up about what I want. B, C, D. Uh, somebody, said, somebody said all of them, yes. Yes, all of them, right. And that was, I'm reading. Can I just? Yeah. Can I just leap in, Liz, and say these actually came from some wonderful work that a coalition in Massachusetts did of surveying a lot of consumers and, and from at, at kind of all levels of health and asking them about what would motivate them to do advanced care planning. And these were some of the reasons that came up. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a number of people saying all of the above, yeah. Yeah. 
And there's crossover with advanced care planning. You know, I want to have a say in my health care decisions. Well, if you're talking about right now, we're talking about shared decision making. Um, and I think one of the things, like, I don't want to have to wonder about my future is so challenging because, like, it seems hard to, to have these conversations. Like, it would be painful to talk about that now. I think about my own family members. And yet, it's such a relief, too, um, you know, in my own experience. And a lot of what we hear from other people is when they do have these conversations, so difficult, they feel much less anxious and their loved ones feel much less anxious afterwards. Um, okay. So when we talk about um, advanced care planning, uh, Dale and I both uh, do work for the Coalition of Supportive Care Kidney Patients, and we created um, a guide that you can actually access as well. Um, but the, the My Way approach is an approach for advanced care planning um, and, and really recognizing that we shouldn't be talking about advanced care planning when people show up in the hospital. We need to be talking about advanced care planning uh, when we're 18 years old and healthy. Um, when, when I used to work as a hospice social worker, um, that was one of the first things I did was create my own advanced care plan so that I could notify my family about what those wishes were. So we have a five-step approach to that, which we'll go over in a minute, um, of how you go about doing that. But what we really like to emphasize is in doing advanced care planning, sometimes I think we can get so hung up in like all of the details and there are, you know, 10,876 scenarios about how this could go. And if we think in that much detail, it becomes really overwhelming. So when we're talking about advanced care planning today and when you do that on your own, we think that it's really helpful for you just to take a deep look at your own values and preferences. Like what things are most important to you when you are sick? Um, so it's not necessarily a list, a checkoff list of I want this and I don't want this, but really under what circumstances um, I want and don't want. So for example, um, a family member of mine met with a palliative care physician at one point and um, had Parkinson's disease. And, and the palliative care a physician was talking about trouble swallowing and, and said, you know, under what circumstances would you want artificial uh, feeding? And, you know, the, the answer was that, that my family member chose was, you know, I don't want it if there's no hope for me and if I'm, you know, not conscious or able to interact. But if I just have, like, acute pneumonia and I'm going to be okay, then I do want a feeding tube. Or, you know, so I think it's important to really think about, you know, what are the circumstances in which you might want to consider that in general terms. So. Steps in the advanced care planning process. Um, these are the five steps. And feel free, you all, to jump in and ask questions, uh, chat in if you want us to elaborate on anything. So the first step that we really encourage people to do is to think about who you would want to make your health care decisions in the event that you can't. You know, a lot of times this is challenging because I hear people say things like, well, you know, I really want my husband to make my decisions for me, but the truth is that I know he's going to keep me on life support until the very end, and that's not what I want. Um, and so part of what this is about is really exploring who do you trust to really follow your wishes? And it doesn't have to be the logical person. It's the person who you think can really carry out that for you. The second step is to really be thinking about what kind of health care would you want if you got so sick that you didn't think you were going to get better, or maybe the health care team didn't think you were going to get better. 
um, you know, in that situation, we, we really want you to start thinking about those wishes and have conversations with your families and friends. Um, so yeah, I'm seeing some comments here. Yeah, sometimes people um, really haven't haven't had some a chance to do that. Um, so um, I'm going to go back to that in just a minute, uh, Vernon. I see your comment there. Um, so the second thing we really want you to do is to think about what kind of health care that you would want if you were unlikely to get better and discuss that. I think the discussion part is so important because in that discussion, you know, we think about deeper issues and other scenarios. And we can also think about what's going to happen, how are we going to handle this situation, especially if emotions are high. So one of the things we know is that when people show up in a hospital, family members get emotional. And when we're emotional, it's sometimes hard to be rational. Um, and so it's good to have these conversations ahead of time to prepare ourselves for when that happens, make sure everybody knows the action plan. Um, the third step is to write your wishes down on a legal form known as an advanced directive. So every state has their own advanced directive uh, form. Sounds like many of you are familiar with that. Some people call it a living will, but to make sure that that form is filled out. And then finally, give a copy of that advanced directive to your healthcare agent and to your kidney team. And I really think that's the most important key takeaway here. Well, the second most important. The first most important is that you have a conversation. The second most important is that you actually give them the form. Because an advanced directive that's in a locked um, safety deposit box isn't going to do us any good in a crisis. So making sure you share that form widely with everyone in the event that something does happen. And then last but not least, discuss that with your health care team um, and keep talking about that. I think the important thing about advanced care planning is also remembering that it is not set in stone. You are allowed to make changes. I've talked to patients who have said, you know, what I thought I wanted at one point, I changed my mind on. I had one uh, patient one time say to me, you know, at one point I thought I never wanted to be on any life support, and then I was on life support, and I did okay, and now I'm okay with it. Um, and so you're free to change that at your discretion. Um, all right, so Vernon, I'm going to read your question. Um, I have a significant amount of patients. Um, who are on their own and really do not have a potential designee. So that is tricky um, when you have patients who don't have a specific designee. I'm not sure what capacity you work with them on, um, but I think the first thing we can do is try to, try to help reach out to family members or friends. But if we really have cases in which there is, is no one, there are times that we can, of course, involve guardians as well, um, social worker in the dialysis center. Okay. I think that what I would do would be have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a client and begin exploring, you know, who would you want me to talk to in the event that you did get really sick? And if there is no one, Dale, do you have some suggestions beyond? Well, well the first suggestion I have there is that um, completing an advanced directive would still be helpful because the person could express their wishes. Like, I would want you know every kind of life support done for as long as possible, or I want to try things, but if they're but stop if they're not working. You know, to, so the advice of what's your sort of basic big goal, and write that down. That is still helpful because then that will guide whoever is. Um, ha having to make decisions, whether that's a court-appointed guardian or um, the, the medical care team. So still go through the, the exercise of doing an advanced directive. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then I think, you know, the other piece of that, you know, the social worker in me is just like, oh, my goodness, and then, you know, making sure we get people connected to their community so that, I mean, that's certainly, a, you know, I'm sure people are very isolated right now, especially with COVID, but any way that we can get people connected 
to others um, is so important to this work as well. So as we, we kind of talk about this, I think one of the important conversations to have with family members is really thinking about what is your big picture here? To what degree is longevity more important than quality of life? and vice versa. To what extent is quality of life more important than length of life? And so when we're talking about that, you know, quality of life becomes, you know, do you feel like you have a quality of life if you're frequently in the hospital? Um, if you are taking medications that really uh, pull you down or maybe create so much energy loss that you can't engage with other people? Um, and all of us are different. And my years of work, I mean, I've met people all over the spectrum. And there is no right or wrong answer here. But I think it's important to take a look at, you know, what is more important to you? What is the big picture? Um, and here are just some examples of some some statements, some similar statements. And you're free to type this in, your response. Um, but you might just want to chew on it, and I'll read these out as well. So if you got so sick that you couldn't do most of what you like to do, uh, what, would you, what would you want? Would you A, say, I want treatments to try to stay alive as long as possible, even if there is little hope for getting better and no matter how much pain or discomfort the care involves? B, I want to try out some treatments for a period of time, but not stay on them if there is little hope for getting better or living a life that I value. C is, I want to be comfortable as possible, even if it means I might not be living as long. And D, I'm not sure. Um, so and Liz, can I jump? Can I? Can I jump in for a minute? Please. Um, so, in the, yeah, in the research that we did using the My Way material, one of the things what that and in the research we did, patients who were prior to being at a dialysis center, patients who had CKD, met with a, a social worker or a nurse that we called a coach to have a discussion, and we found that that coaching seemed to be most helpful to the people who weren't sure. So there's, there is definitely a set of people who, who have either have not thought about this a lot or find it very confusing to think about. And so if you are one of those people, I, I would say findings and, you know, coaches for advanced care planning aren't, they're not uh, a routine part of care at this point, but I would say finding somebody you can talk it through with and then at the end of this presentation, we're going to show you some websites that have very, we're not going to show you, we'll tell you about some websites that have very good videos, very good explanatory material. So I want to give you hope that if you feel like you, it's confusing and you don't really know, that there are ways to sort through that and kind of get more clarity. And as Liz said, to change. You know, you could be at one place now and, and change later. Right. And I think about, like, in my practice experience, um, you know, I would have patients that would sometimes say, you know, I want all the pain medicine that I can get. Like, please, you know, I don't want to experience any pain at all. Give me the maximum amount I'm allowed to have no matter what. And then I sometimes would have other patients that would say, you know, my grandchildren are flying in from Florida tonight. I haven't seen them in a year. And... I don't want any medication because I really, really need to be able to see and engage with with my grandchildren. And I think that's part of what this question is. And again, that, that goes back and forth, um, you know, that can shift. But those are the kind of things that I think are important to think about and communicate about. Um, and so, right, uh, Dale just shared this. This slide, you know, it's just so important that you get those wishes written down, and here is the information about how you can do that, which also includes information about a medical order. So in addition to advanced care planning, 
Um, states also have medical orders that physicians can sign um, that really explicitly order what your wishes are. So the website is listed here how to find out more about that as well. And, and that would, uh, and sorry, Liz, I didn't mean to advance it. I don't know if, if I okay. did by accident. Um, but a post would be another answer to the question about what to do for someone who has no one. So the pulse is medical orders, and and someone can express their you know what they want, but it becomes an in the pulse form an actual medical order that can be acted on across um, across the the divides between nursing home, hospital, uh, ambulance, even posts in in the state. In almost all states, have them now. Um, go kind of follow the patient across those those um, divisions between the care settings. Okay. And I think this is over to you, Dale. Okay. So, again, um, what we were talking about in advanced care planning is how do, you, how do you have some control about the future of your health care if you get into a situation where you can't speak for yourself? And now in shared decision-making, we're talking about here I am right now, and in fact, even the example that Liz gave of someone whose grandchildren are coming in, the person's on hospice, and they say, you know, I don't want any medicines right now that are going to you know, snow me or make me feel like I, I can't. That person is actually doing shared decision making because that person is saying, this is what I want right now. So I, I would even call that shared decision making. So. In general, you know, most people, there, there are a couple examples. There are some people who say, I just want the doctor to decide, the doctor knows best, or I want my, you know, my daughter to decide, I don't want to be involved. And that's okay. You know, that, that, that's okay. But most people, about 8 and 10, say that they want to be mostly involved and to be listened to and have what they want, you know, guide their care. But there's a gap in terms of people saying they want that and then actually getting it to happen. Only half of people say that their clinician asked them about their goals and their concerns. So we're not doing a good job on the healthcare provider side of asking people and you know, like making the care fit them. So this notion of shared decision making is something that has been around that we're trying to teach the providers, and it's been in many of the guidelines that professional associations make. And it's when you go into the the literature for the when we say the providers for the the doctors, nurses, and social workers, they, there's all this stuff about how can they do shared decision making. When Liz and I were prepping for this for talking with you guys, we realized there's really been hardly anything to tell the patient, to tell us as patients, how do we, how do, what's our role in shared decision making? How do we engage in it? And so that's what we're um, wanting to talk about. So the old model, you know, you think about, was it Marcus Welby or, you know, the, 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 the wonderful physician who went from house to house and the old country doctor um, they may have known their patients very well, but there was also a part of that old model in which it's the doctor who knows what's best and makes the decision. In the new model, it's really the sense of doctor and patient deciding together. And each has, a patient has the places where they're expert and the doctor or, or nurse has the places where they are expert. So what is it that the patient, I'm saying patient, but that's us. I, I'm a patient too sometimes. We know about our history. We know about our values. We know what we want and we don't want. We know about our goals. We are expert on that. Nobody, nobody else except us knows that. And then we look to the providers to give us information about, okay, what, what is the problem, the diagnosis? Prognosis, what's likely to happen with this problem? You know, is it going to get worse? Is it going to get worse faster or slower? What does worse look like? You know, what, what often people think that prognosis, and there's a lot of emphasis on prognosis being this 
you know, how long do I have, doctor? But it's not just length of life that people are concerned about. People are concerned about, you know, am I going to be able to do the things I want to do? And how, how slowly or quickly do I have to prepare to, to not, for instance, be able to walk? You know, will I need a wheelchair? Or, or to not be able to live by myself? Will I need help? So that, I put that in prognosis as well. And then treatment options. So what, you know, what are the possibilities? What can we do about it? And then this fulcrum where, where this lever is balancing, the red box that we have where we say attention is paid to be sure patient understands information and physician or provider understands patient's values, preferences, and goals. So the art of shared decision making is this conversation that goes back and forth um, where the physicians, the provider should ideally be asking you what's important to you, what are your goals, what are your hopes, what are your concerns, and should then be listening to that, giving you an opportunity to explore that, and then is providing information and then checking whether you understand that information because one of the things we know that happens is a lot of the information comes in the form of medical terminology that we don't understand, or it comes very fast, or it comes at us at a time when we just heard some bad news and we can't really absorb a lot of information. So providing information in a way that, that people can take it in, absorb it, and use it. And a lot of the professional uh, um, effort around shared decision making involves making what are called clinical decision aids. So figuring out ways to provide information for people so they can make decisions. So you may have encountered some of that when you were choosing, for instance, did you want to do hemodialysis in a center or do peritoneal dialysis at home. So there's so much that goes into that. And if you were doing some education about those modalities, that would be called, you know, clinic, we probably were presented with what are called clinical decision aids. And that would be part of this shared decision making because there's not a right answer. You know, it, it, it depends what you value in terms of uh, peritoneal home dialysis versus in center, right? So there's not a right answer on that. So well, before actually before I go into the barriers, I, if you have any questions or or concerns, I'd be interested whether any of you feel that you actually do engage in shared decision making. Do you feel like this process happens in your care, or do you feel like you don't get the information you need, or you're not asked for your values? I'd be interested. So you can you can chat that into us. And then we want to talk a little bit about the barriers and what gets in the way. So, Liz? Yes. So um, we kind of brought this question here because we have heard over and over again some of the barriers from provider and, and some of the barriers from um, patient and caregiver in. Um, and we wanted to sort of explore some of that with you all as well. That's this, this picture. You can see this poor man is trying so hard to get somewhere, but there is a barrier in the way of him, and we know that happens as well. So one of the things that I just wanted to share is a couple of summers ago, I um, asked um, about 20 patients and caregivers, their experiences in engaging in, in these kind of conversations. And some of the things that I learned or heard from patients I've put in this slide. Um, and so people say, you know, sometimes I don't want to talk about advanced care planning or shared decision making because um, I feel like the healthcare providers aren't telling me everything anyway. So there's not an opportunity. You know, I've got this 15-minute appointment or less, and we're covering all these other things, and, like, how do I even fit it in? How, where, how do I even enter into that? 
some people said to me, you know, I've had some really rough conversations in the past about this with other family members. Like, oh my gosh, we went through this with my brother. All these things happened. You know, the family got all upset. And I'm, I'm nervous about bringing that up. I'm, I'm nervous that if I bring it up, people are going to get emotional. Other people say, I'm afraid if I bring this up that uh, the healthcare providers are going to feel like I'm stepping on their toes, which is like when people said that to me, I was surprised. And then I've had this interaction with a family member of my own who's had a lot of health problems this year. And I realized that when I went to advocate for my loved one, I was sitting there worried about the healthcare provider's feelings. I was literally worried about whether they were going to, like, judge me for advocating. And so I was like, oh, my gosh, this one is really real. Um, and then the last one is I'm worried that I'm going to get emotional or that my family members will get emotional. And so I think there are lots of other barriers why that happens. But I think it's important to pay attention to each one of these. Um, and I think the message that Dale and I want to say is, while we are working very hard with providers to have these conversations, uh, we know that that's not always happening. And it is your explicit right to bring that up with a provider. Um, you know, so if we're looking at that first and third bullet there, about fear of what's going to happen with the healthcare provider. Um, you know, I, I reminded myself in my own situation, these are the paid professionals here, and this is the only way to get the healthcare that, you know, my family member needs right now. Um, so we're, I'm going to share a little bit more about that. And then the, the second and the fourth bullet really speaks to, you know, our history about dealing with these things, and it is a difficult topic. Um, yet at the same time, I think a lot of times when we look back at a history that's been difficult, it's often grounded in the fact that we didn't have conversations ahead of time. And so um, knowing that even if we're emotional in the moment, that um, hopefully what that's going to do is reduce really strong emotions in the middle of a crisis when, when we really need to process information. So we so, are, can I jump in? Can I can I jump yeah. in again one more time? I just, I just want to reemphasize what you said that that we think that this is that it is a responsibility for clinicians to bring this stuff up, but when we're working with them, they have a whole set of barriers on their side. They don't have enough time. They don't feel comfortable. They're worried that the patients are going to get emotional. I mean, there's a whole set of barriers on their side, and so just to reemphasize that. In a in a perfect world, they would be bringing they would be bringing it up. They would be helping you have these conversations. It would all be smooth. And we recognize it's not, and it shouldn't be your responsibility. We know one more thing you have to do when when you're trying to arrange your health care, but it is sometimes, unfortunately. So it is, and you know, and sorry. sometimes we have to. Um, explain to healthcare providers, you know, I um, have a family member that is a palliative care patient, and when that person presented in the hospital, um, and the hospitalist, I told the hospitalist that, they were like, what is she on palliative care for? She's not dying. And I was like, well, you don't have to be dying to be on palliative care. Um, and, you know, I thought, like, oh, I'm going to get a bristly response here. But Unfortunately, the onus was on me to offer that education, um, and, and ultimately it worked out. But um, we recognize we recognize that it can be challenging, which is why this slide is here for you. Um, and that is just really practicing how to assertively ask asking for help when you're on dialysis. This is a, a tool that we actually teach our graduate social work students. Um, to help with clients just across the board. And it's an approach, um, it's called the hard assertive communication approach. And so it's really about helping you frame what you need. So um, recognizing, A, I have a feeling. So what is it that you feel? And, and that's really tapping into, I think you've all heard about um, I statements before. So it's always important when we need to, um, 
advocate for ourselves to start out with, I feel anxious about, I feel upset about, I feel whatever. Mm -hmm. And then B, what it is that the person is doing. So the second part of the sentence is, you know, I feel anxious when the staff doesn't wear their mask in what situation the third part of the sentence is describing the situation i feel anxious when the staff doesn't wear their mask when they are cannulating me and sneezing so i've been able to spell out explicitly what the problem is and then the last part of that is and i would like so being able to be clear about what it is you want what is your ask i would like for the staff to wear their mask all the time but we can do the same thing with advanced care planning um, I feel very nervous about the, I feel very nervous when you come and talk to me about my future health care needs and it sounds like things aren't going the way you thought or the way we thought. And I would like it if we can talk about what my health care is going to look like in the future. I would like it if we could talk about what is going to happen if I have to go to the hospital. I would like it if we could talk about X, Y, and Z. So just getting some practice in assertively asking for help, I think, is key. Um, and so that's, that is why we have that, that slide there. So I think there are lots of different things. This is also a good one. If you are disgusted with the fact that your spouse doesn't do dishes, um, you can also use the hard communication tool um, in that regard as well. But I think, you know, it can help alleviate some of the stress and certainly some of the emotion as um, we move through our healthcare journey when we're able to articulate those kind of things um, as well. Okay, are you there now? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I check whether I was on mute. So here are some resources for you, and I do hope that you can actually use these links. Let me let me talk you through a couple of these. The Co Coalition for Supportive Care, we have a lot of material. We're revising our website, not the easiest website to use right now. But one of the things on the website you see to the in the box on the blue is the My Way material about advanced care planning. There are two things there. One is there's a patient guide, and that gives you much more detail and some worksheets on, on all of what we've just talked about for advanced care planning. There's also a curriculum guide for coaches, for these coaches we talked about who we worked with CKD clinics to have coaching with patients about their advanced care plans. And, you know, you could, you could uh, tell your dialysis social worker, hey, go check this out. We like it. The third thing I would really recommend to you is a website called Prepare for Your Care. Um, and someone chatted in that you've seen some good advanced directive forms that assist patients to identify values and preferences. This is one of, yes, there are some really good forms out there. And this is one of the sites I would highly recommend. They've done a lot of work to make the form itself use simple language. They have graphics. It's it's quite easy to use. People really like it. They also have a lot of, if you're, if you're comfortable working with the, some, a website, they have videos. They have little um, um, sort of exercises where you can say what you want. And then it, it, if you go through kind of a survey that they have online, it spits out for you a form that, that not, not a directive form, but it, it, it sort of puts out a summary of your um, what you've said you value. So I highly recommend that. And then the Pulse. So we talked about Pulse as being, Pulse is the, um, a next step. Pulse, after you've done advanced directive, so advanced directive is what you sign as a patient. It's, it's completely under your control. But then it still has to be, the, the um, healthcare system still has to put that in place. Pulse or MOLS, it's called different things in different states. As I said before, are actual medical orders. So they're signed by your physician. But their site has a lot of good, also good videos and good explanations. So I would recommend their site as well. Um, I think that we are open now to your questions and 
We'd like to know what else. You know, Liz and I can talk about this stuff for hours. So what, what would you like us to talk about? And, and what have been some of your experiences? And chat into the chat box. So it's a quiet group. It not, is. We're not, yeah. It's a lot. It was a lot of information um, to give, and I think Dale, you provided a lot of really outstanding resources. Um, and I just want to echo that the the coalition has many uh, great resources on their website as well. Um, certainly, if you're looking for more information, um, we'd be happy to connect you to that um, to make sure that that we can get you to the state appropriate websites, et cetera, to get the right forms um, as well. Um, so we're getting, getting again in the question, uh, what to do about someone who doesn't have doesn't someone can, who can help them. I, I think I would go back to they should do an advanced, they can still do an advanced directive because it's really helpful for them to say, you know, I would want everything, or I would want to try things, or I would want quality of life as the main goal. That's really helpful. And then have the physician in, do a pulse most in discussion with them, because that becomes the medical orders. Um, if they're really on their own, you know, you might, as Liz said, might be thinking about how, what role do you have in helping them connect up with social services or, um, a guardian of some community, kind. yeah, um, and 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 I think thinking about that and doing it ahead of time is really useful. I think one of the other things just to know, like a tidbit of information that might be helpful, is some states do require your advance directives be notarized, um, oh, no. which is well. I'll leave my opinion out of that, but. Um, you should check on that, and you know if if it is notarized, usually the you know there are services around town that you can get that done relatively easy. But that is that is actually a benefit of the most or post form over the advance directive is that it doesn't have to be notarized. But usually you're not using those forms unless you really are in uh, a situation in which you're really really sick. Yeah. Pulse and Mulse is usually used kind of the last year of life. Right. And this is uh, this is Kathy. I know that um, some lawyer offices also have people that can that can be listed as the um, person for advanced directives. I learned mm. about that recently, so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll share that. So um, they have a either I guess they have a list of people or you can get that through a lawyer's office at, at least that's what I was told so um, that would be one other way to help find somebody to be an advocate mm -hmm. to somebody directive um, I think that you have shared lots of information with people and and this is a, a happy topic so there's lots to think about um, and we will we have the the webinar on uh, recording on our website, and we also have the article that you both had written for um, our Kidney Citizen newsletter. So we can make that available as well. Um, and I just want to thank both of you um, and the Coalition for Supportive Care of Kidney Patients for such an excellent presentation with lots of food for thought and. Um, hopefully everyone now who doesn't have an advanced directive um, will be on that path to get one very soon. Thank you we for the also, opportunity, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy, oh, thank you. And, go ahead. I have a, um, 
a comment about the uh, advanced directive. Um, I have a case on that uh, about advanced directive. Some people will respect you and some will not. So what do you do in a case like that? And do, you mean respect the, do you mean that, uh, that it won't be honored? In, it won't be honored in the hospital, for instance. Yes, they uh, yeah. they would not uh, uh, contact you until the person has crossed over and you presented. Mm -hmm. Advanced director was there when the person went in, but then at the end mm -hmm. of life and stuff, you was not allowed to go in. And you were right. not called until everything was over. Wow. And it sounds like you've so, had that experience. It was very bad. So um, yeah. if people want to get it, uh, advanced directive, make sure, um, I mean, it was <laughs> it was to the top of the heap. I mean, but it was at the beginning of the pandemic, and stuff, everyone was going panicking and et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. guess all of us, we can learn, but my loved one did not have COVID at all. It was just, mm -hmm. it was just one of those things. But, you know, but we can always advance for someone else. I am so sorry well, that that happened. Um, you know, I think that, you know, there are circumstances where they don't get followed. I see that also in the chat. Somebody talked in, just ch chatted in similarly. Does an advance directive override any family member's decision? You know, and I think the legal answer is that it's not supposed to, but does it happen in reality? You know, especially when, you know, we're in a crisis. I think it, it does. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, I don't really have specific advice, but I think that that's exactly why it's important to be, use those assertive techniques as like strongly and fiercely as you can in those situations, because you, can, you can't wait for people to ask you. Um, now with COVID, that's a totally separate, I mean, I was, you know, not being able to even get to the hospital or be contacted by the hospital, I've heard similar complaints um, from other people, and I just, I hate that. I hope that we learn and train providers to do better and develop better systems because of it. Um, but no doubt, um, all the more reason to, I think, keep, keep on practicing doing the advanced directive. Mm -hmm. So one of, and I also want to say, I'm so sorry that happened, and it shouldn't have, and the pandemic has made things worse, but even without the pandemic, you know, it's, we have a lot to learn as a society about how to do the whole, as I call it, the end of the story to make it a much better experience. I do want to respond to this question, does an advanced directive override any family decisions? Um, depending on the advanced directive form, some forms ha help you be very explicit. And, and I believe the one on the PREPARE website, which we recommended, does this. You can say whether, how much um, discretion you want to give your decision maker versus how much you want your advanced directive followed to the letter. And, and so some advanced directives really let you spell that out where you can say, do exactly this, you have to do exactly what I say, others, or I'm giving you a lot of discretion, my decision maker is this person and they can decide what they think is best for me. So again, that's something you can control and even if the form doesn't let you say that, you can write, you know, write that into the form. I have another question. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. All of that was uh, spelled out, but that was something that um, the position decided to do. It was everything was spelled out. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well, was, and that's very unfortunate. Yeah. And yeah, beyond okay. unfortunate, the, the New York Times just had a whole article about people suing because they their advanced directives have not been followed. Um, that is correct. Yeah, yeah. Which is sad. Yeah. It's, it's sad. It's really. It's very. Sad. But we can always yeah. we can all learn from this. Yeah. Well, and I think your story is important. I mean, I think it. You know, it's a case of how you know 
the care a person really wanted didn't happen and you know doing what you're doing and speaking out and educating people about how to make that happen is is powerful uh, we have one question from Carmen shouldn't all doctors have a copy of your advance directive um, they should um, I think sometimes what happens is access right so you know I think about some of my family members have physicians who might have a copy of the advance directive but they aren't the attending physician at the hospital um, you know they might not have privileges at the hospital and so that's part of the reason why we got to spread that thing far and wide um, because if you stay West Virginia is one of them have what are called registries where you I think Arizona has one there are a few that have them where you can sort of put your advanced directive into the registry and they're electronically available to any provider we don't have that everywhere there are also a few private companies that are doing that but none of them in my knowledge are yet big enough that sort of everyone knows oh yeah let's go there and check for it so that's that's a place we need to evolve as a country. We we need to all know, you know, where's it where's the advanced directive stored and how do I get to it when it's needed. It doesn't do you any good if it's sitting in a bank safety deposit box or sitting at your lawyer's office, which is kind of the system that was developed twenty years ago. Kathy, I think we should stop talking. We <laughs> Liz and I could keep going. Oh uh, well Thank you both so much. We certainly appreciate it. Um, again, um, your knowledge and information has been really helpful. If anyone has additional questions, feel free to send them to us, and we will make sure that Liz and Dale also get them. So um, again, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, everyone, I hope you will complete the feedback form and join us next month on February 25th for our webinar on the how-tos to building a top-notch immune system with lifestyle changes. Thank you, everyone, for sharing the hour with us, and stay safe. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.